We're live now. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode of VCTV, the Venture Capital TV from La Token. Um, I'm Sunny Mohanty, the original director of La Token here in Singapore. Um, so we have a very interesting session today <laughs> on the beginning of the week on a Monday. Apparently, uh, we have one speaker from Middle East who is very much keen to speak um, about uh, her experience and insights touching up on, up on the world. Uh, hi, Helen. So we have Helen Tang from Dubai, uh, Middle East, like Dubai, I guess. <laughs> so, so today it's going to be, Helen, welcome to my show again. I mean, we've spoken last week, I guess. Welcome to show. This is a very special show today because we just have you and me. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that works for me as well. <laughs> So it's going to be like, a, I wish we had a fireside. It could be a fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> yes, it yeah. So it's, we have one hour session. Let's make it interactive between you and me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, sure. so because, yeah, you are into a right profession to be able to answer what's going on around the world. And yeah, so here we go. So let's start with our introduction. Take your time with your introduction, what you've done over the years. And yes. we'll go from there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, Sonny, it's so great to see you again. And uh, some of you may have heard me last week, some may not. So my name is Helen and I'm from Australia. I've been brought up in Australia, studied in Hong Kong and then in the UK, qualified as a lawyer, a barrister. So I tend to deal with disputes. However, at some point in my life, I did actually think and rethink about what to do with my life. And I ended up spending some time working with startups. So I spent a three month stint at um, NASA actually with Singularity University looking at emerging technologies, looking at how uh, to help startups. And so I actually from there ended up being funded by the Swiss government to go to Bosnia Herzegovina to train entrepreneurs, to teach them how to pitch, how to engage with startups and also investors. And I had the opportunity to also go to Japan uh, where I actually was funded by the European Commission and also by the Japan Ministry of Economics. What was interesting there was uh, this you know, million dollar question, how do you double the space sector in Japan? So I worked at a very, you could say high level, but at the same time, I was very interested in startups on the ground. You know, what were the challenges? What were the opportunities? And that led me to coming to the Middle East where my first role was actually as a project manager looking into reinsurance on rocket launches and satellites. And at the same time, what was interesting was, you know, there's the booming sector of the space sector. This is well before COVID-19. Um, so I actually helped out in the space legislation as well, looking at space debris, space orbit reinsurance. And then I reverted back to my ordinary role of helping businesses, startups, um, doing business in the Middle East. So to give you a background, so I'm qualified as a barrister in the UK, so England and Wales. And I'm also qualified here in Dubai, what they call a law consultant, because um, as you may know, only local lawyers can represent clients in court but I'm registered as what you call a DIFC Dubai International Financial Center advocate so I um, basically can represent clients in court and uh, deal with all the DIFC matters so you've got the onshore which is um, the UAE law and then you've got the offshore which is uh, DIFC so that's sort of me in a nutshell right now and in my firm at Hamdan Al Shamsi we deal with a sort of full service you know, from your very simple contracts to banking, construction, um, you know, civil to criminal, as we call it. And startups is an area that we're very interested in. In fact, um, for the next two weeks, uh, we are actually holding one hour seminars at the Youth Hub, which is organized under the auspices of the Prime Minister's office here in Dubai. So when you have a chance to come to Dubai, I welcome you to visit Emirates Tower, where it's very exciting there. There's a lot of, I remember when I first went there, and I saw the Department of Possibilities. I just thought this is not your usual government office, <laughs> but um, it's very it's very inspiring. Um, and is this a good time for me to also talk about a little bit about Dubai, the Middle East as a market? Of yeah. course. That of course. Oh, okay. Of course. Yeah. yeah, so basically, as most of you know, um, so UAE uh, is a pretty young country, let's say, you know, 30, 40 years ago when they discovered oil. And from there, you will hear stories of people from taxi drivers to, you know, the elder senior people would say, you know, I came here and there was nothing or there were five buildings. Now, if you come along Sheikh Sayyid Road, it's full of construction. It's got the world, as you may know, you know, seven star hotels, the tallest, the world's tallest building. And in fact, they're building the next biggest um uh, shopping mall in the in I was going to say the universe, but actually shopping mall in the Middle East, and 
And so that gives you a context of how ambitious this young country is. And um, so I came here because of space, but at the same time, it's a thriving, you know, business uh, environment. So I can speak quite comfortably with about the JFC for those that may be interested. So the Dubai International Financial Center was set up to actually encourage foreign businesses to come, uh, to come and basically set up offices. So I guess in terms of our current audience would primarily be startups or you know investors who are interested in the market now what's been quite interesting so i've been sort of visiting the dfc quite regularly to meet clients and one of the recent developments is they have what they call a fintech hive so for all you guys who are into fintech i would highly recommend to visit it because it is plush new offices they've literally done a whole extension during COVID 19 to expand the offices and to grow it so you know while some people might be at home doing exercises you know the dfc has, has actually been very proactive to make the most of their time so what you will find there is you'll find it's a it's a very it's like any you know accelerator very nice office for with a view of encouraging encouraging startups to come and settle in, I guess, for, you know, the DIFC Tech Hive. And there, you could say for them, like all accelerators, they are there not just because of the location, but potentially for the networks that they have in the Middle East. So, for example, when I was traveling, you know, be it in Hong Kong, Ukraine, you know, America, and I speak to people about the Middle East, they're very intrigued. They're like, hmm, so you speak Arabic? So my answer is no, I don't. And then secondly is, well, you're a woman. And I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't stop you from doing business either. And then the third thing is, well, how is it actually doing business here? Because, you know, I've spoken to investors. I've been there one year. I've waited one year. And nothing's happened. So the default position is a lot of entrepreneurs would actually go to America because they say it's faster, easier. But actually, you know, I'm sure most of you know, the investors here are also very serious. There are a lot of families or family offices, as it were, which right. is somewhat unique compared to maybe what I would call other jurisdictional countries. And there's a lot of high net worth individuals. It's not to say other countries don't. Obviously, Singapore has plenty. But in terms of investments, it's a huge thing. And I know just before us doing this live, we were talking you know, about how for a lot of them, they do want to invest. The question is, they may not know exactly what a startup is about. Right. So it's no different, by the way, like any other investor, right? So they will look at, obviously, your pitch deck, they will look at your team, they will look at your product, your service, and they just need to understand that you've, you, you know, you're, you've got something viable for them to sort of invest in. And so, you know, for so many of the wealthy clients that I've um or the businesses, you know, that I've spoken to, they do traditional investments. So they do what I would say, run of the mill, you know, banking, or they would have, you know, properties or, you know, assets that you and I would identify as normal and, and recognizable. So when you suddenly jump into like say FinTech or blockchain or not, they get very excited and curious, but then they will pull back because they're quite conservative. And they say, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know. So there is an element of education that's needed on both end from the startup side and I think also from the, the business and the regulatory side. So to give you an idea, it's only about a, uh, literally two weeks ago that there was a um, securities token offering that was launched. It's one of the biggest in Dubai in the Middle East. So that is how new it is. And in terms of regulation, I would say it's still uh, relatively slower because I mentioned to you a moment ago, for example, in terms of bankruptcy laws, in terms of data protection laws, new laws were released. Um, so bankruptcy laws released one year ago, um, data protection laws about a year ago. So we are in the Middle East, or at least in the UAE, a few years behind. Um, other countries or European jurisdictions. But the good thing about that is that it means that if you come first, then you're a first mover. So there are benefits to that as well, because you can actually shape, you know, the law and policy that that comes with whatever product you're trying to launch. So so that's sort of like uh, the Middle East in a yeah. nutshell, um, with Dubai as a main focus. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. I think you've touched upon many things uh, to start with, which is a good thing. Uh, I want to start with What's the status of COVID-19 in Dubai? Oh, okay. What's, what's happening? Because you just mentioned that startups mm -hmm. now move to this office, which has been supported by the DIFC for networking purposes. Yes. So is it like operational now? And yes. 
Yeah, I'd just like to know yeah, what yeah. So, yeah, so actually, so Dubai is quite a, what I call a transitional place. So if you were to look at the flights, and previously when I was studying, you know, living in Australia, studying in the UK, I would travel via, you know, Dubai quite often. So Dubai is one of those places where, you know, like Emirates is one of the biggest airlines. So you get people from all nationalities, all backgrounds um, coming via Dubai. And I guess the up and down of it is I've actually met people who were coming to Dubai especially because of COVID-19, because they thought, well, the weather is so hot, it may well kill off the virus by summer. And you had people who were actually stuck in Dubai, who then thought, well, why don't I try and look for a job in Dubai? So I think because of the situation in COVID, it's very unusual, let's put it this way. But you do have, um, so at the beginning, we did have the lockdown two weeks at a time, which I thought was very smart of the government, because in other jurisdictions like Melbourne, where they go, right, we're going to lock everyone down for six weeks, it does create a sense of uncertainty in a way that people would feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I think the government handled the situation very well. I think they are very vigorous in their testing. So in another um, state like Abu Dhabi, they've been far more stricter. So, you, you know, every time you come in and out, you actually have to be, to have to be tested. Um, Dubai has not been like that. But for example, now if people want to fly, they need permission. So you need like a certificate or something to fly out and fly back in. And I think that's just a way to, you know, I guess responsible governance, right? To, to make sure that, you know, people are tracked and traced in a way that maybe in the past people wouldn't be so open to it. So I think um, we're managing very well. I mean, everyone has to wear, you know, masks, gloves, but in the office, it's business as usual. And in fact, we've been sort of back, you know, full service in the office. Of course, those that want to or wish to work from home, they can do that as well. So it's, to a certain extent, it's much freer. And I think because the figures have been relatively low, so, yeah, so I think we've been feeling a lot more comforted by it. Touch wood, there's no second or third wave coming. Um, but so far, I think it feels okay. How about how about Singapore? How's how's that going there? Oh yeah, great. I mean, uh, good to know about Dubai. Yeah, Singapore is yeah, is yeah. doing fine as well. Like as you said, Dubai, like uh, Singapore just completed, uh, you know, 55 years of uh, independence. Like we had the National Day yesterday. Oh, great! Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so so yeah i mean we're doing fine we don't have any waves uh, second waves as well like economy uh, opened up in phases and we have this app uh, it's called trace me app that is a mandatory thing to have on your phone and um, everywhere you go you have to um, scan get into a safe zone get your uh, temperature checked in and out mm -hmm. everywhere so you have safe mm -hmm. zones and you have to follow the um, follow it as a, a religiously so mm -hmm. so we have been traced and tracked everywhere you go mm -hmm. so that you know the, the numbers uh, remain uh, contained so yeah. that's the beauty about smart cities like singapore and dubai mm -hmm. to be honest you know because the, mm -hmm. the technology um, mm -hmm. so it's so easy to monitor it's easy to keep this uh, contained but see other countries like um bigger countries like when it's when you hit europe or us i mean Things mm -hmm. are blowing out of proportion. And yeah. good thing about, um, I think, Singapore and Dubai, I think people do follow the uh, laws, right? So we, we do wear the mask when we're out. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we yes. do wear the mask. We do follow mm -hmm. the social distancing measures. Yeah. You know, if there are only five people allowed to sit in a restaurant, we do follow that yes, very yeah. much, very strictly. And yeah. the mask is a must. Yeah. So that has obviously helped to contain mm. the virus uh, in a big way in Singapore. Mm. So I think this is the safest place. I mean, obviously, uh, Dubai, obviously, for you is home. For me, Singapore is home. So I find it very safe to be here, to moving around, um, yes. uh, to, to go for like a jog. Uh, I feel very mentally relieved when, I, when I'm inside mm. here. Um, mm. So yeah, it's the same thing. And the startup community, you know, in Singapore is also like, you know, quite uh, buzzing uh, before the COVID-19, but it's still there. I mean, obviously, the momentum has gone down a bit because of uh, less travel, no conferences, because obviously this was the hub. I think Dubai and Singapore are the two big cities, I would say cities, <laughs> uh, who uh, ha held many uh, global conferences mm. over the year. Yeah. So I think if Singapore was my first home, it's my first home, Dubai was my second home last till last oh. year. I used to oh. be in Dubai for like almost every month I used to be there. Oh, for right. yeah. months. So I think these countries have, have, have a lot of similarities in terms yeah. of governance, yeah. uh, laws and regulations. People are law abiding, people are serious about uh, investments, be it startups or investors. 
all the serious things get done. <laughs> I can I can say because I live here, and obviously you are from Dubai. So so let's talk about the startup community, how resilient they are. So let's start in Dubai, then we can move slowly because you also have experience in, uh, experience work in Japan and Australia, maybe uh, USA as well. So how resilient the startups are? How what kind of pivots have you seen uh, in during this uh, time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, this question is very timely because it's also in context of COVID-19. So I think um, if I take it a step back and before we go to startups, talk about law firms, is okay. I think for a lot of law firms traditionally, you know, they would win clients and, you know, by meeting the client and all this kind of stuff. And for those that are resistant, I would say that business wouldn't be doing so good. And so you know, for those that are more tech savvy or can catch up on tech, I think um, they're in a much better position. I think that's the same with startups. I think um, the interesting thing about, I think, uh, COVID-19 is quite quickly, we've all had to learn the hard way um, and to manage our time better. So for example, some people would feel that they're working 24 seven being at home, while some people can have clear distinctions and say, I wake up at this time, I go home and, um, you know, call it a day. Um, I think actually COVID-19 for me, if I look at the silver lining, yeah, I would say it's actually brought the future here. What I mean by that is I'm quite a strong advocate of using technology in, say, the legal realm. But because of COVID-19, I feel like um, everything we thought about in the future has just fast forwarded. So, for example, where in the past you say, I need to meet my mum, my sister and everything. So now, you know, I think businesses that do VR headsets, you know, that are able to give a sort of 360 degree feel when they talk to their family and friends are doing far better. So we, we you know, we talk about, you know, like businesses, like uh, food deliveries, yeah, they've gone up by 200%. We talk about Netflix entertainment that's gone up, gone off the roof, yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing, gloves supply and also sanitation and, you know, mask is that has also gone out of hand i remember there's one startup that i know of who actually was doing um masks in china um at the time but he stopped production three months before COVID 19 started so i said look you know you could have been a billionaire in six months but anyway that's a different story so i think to to ride out the wave of COVID 19 not knowing when is there an end date but let's be resilient, like I use the word that you use, is that we need to plan a bit long term. So let's say we give it another, you know, half year to one year. But then by that stage, the way we work would have also changed, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, I took part in an organizational um challenge, actually it's called the EXO Challenge, EXO Alliance. You can have a look at them and it's talking about transformational organizations. And I think COVID-19 poses a challenge, you know, because startups are still organizations. It's just maybe a smaller, you know, CEO, CTO, and a few other people. But it's how you adapt and change to survive and thrive, right? So it's important that we look at not just surviving, but how do we, you know, really thrive. And I think, you know, for example, people who negotiate. So I've heard people who negotiate phone bills, rentals, you know, you name it, you know, being on a shoestring because things are just not coming and going, right? So I think actually COVID-19 is a really good time for people to sit, meditate, and really think strategically, okay, with limited time and resources, how can I really, it's like planting seeds. I use that analogy because right now it's not about the sale in the same way. I mean, sure, you can go online, you can try and sell what you can, but there's a problem of shipping. There's a problem of supply chain, right? So then you go, okay, well, what if I start planting ideas? What if I start doing a marketing strategy? You know, so I think there is still possible growth but the focus would be different. Like, so people thinking about recruitment, retention. And I think one of the interesting things is, you know, countries saying, okay, well, I can't recruit. Okay, so one of two things, yeah, I can't recruit internationally because there's no flights. I will look internally. So then there's a lot more focus of, you know, looking for talent. Like I know Singapore is one of those countries, right? Or, or you could say, well, I can recruit internationally, but then it's a given that they're going to work remotely. So you see how the notion of flexibility is really stretched but the beauty of it means then you really have no borders right? right where in the past you say okay you have to come and travel you have to meet my clients and customers then you have to think creatively well okay let's say i'm a startup okay i can physically come to singapore or physically come to dubai or i just hire someone that i've met once or twice online like this and then let's just let's just do it let's just try it and and give it a go right so i think 
the, the whole notion of trust, which then comes back to this notion of blockchain, is really tested, right? Because what you're trying to do is, in essence, you're trying to get people to learn, to trust, to see whether they can do business deals, be it not, you know, physically sending over a shipment, because it, it may well be delayed for a few months now. But this idea of, well, can we still do transactions, still do business online without you know, without the physical, you know, because a lot of businesses still here, even in Dubai, they prefer face to face, right? So they would say, okay, well, let me meet you first, Helen, before we sign this. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You just want to check that I'm 3D. That's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, not just a robot behind a screen that I actually am, you know, someone you can see. That's not a problem. So we could still do that. But I think in situations where there's a limited constraint, where, you know, it's very, you know, like when you look at angel list and you look at all these possibilities, I think for me, I meet far more people online, say on LinkedIn, than I do face to face, which is, I think, a phenomenon that that will be increasingly more so. And this idea of us being increasingly more comfortable, right? So it may well be, you know, first degree, second degree referral, but I think this idea of doing business will eventually change. And what you're doing right now, you know, at um, the token is the right thing. You, you're, you're trying to gain trust. You're trying to engage with your target audience, you know, in a way that they're going to be so familiar with you and who you are and what you're presenting that, that there's no question that they will come to you if, there's, if they've got any questions about security tokens, right? <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, on that point, Helen, you rightly pointed out. The thing is, when somebody asked me, like, how could you pull off, pull off doing the shows like Monday to Friday? Yeah. I said, okay, I am quite passionate about talking to people. I really, you know, the, the thing is, the whole point of me traveling around the world and uh, attending those conferences was just meeting people, networking, and that obviously has stopped because no travels, right? no conferences. Yeah. So we pivoted, like Lato can pivoted quite early on uh, mm. this year in, in February, just you know, the, just about the right time when COVID nineteen wow, happened. Yeah. We pivoted like in February, and when I saw the concept, I was like wowed with the concept. But not many people could think through this, like how you're going to mm -hmm. have everybody on a on a VCTV and you know uh, still do networking. Uh, yeah. A lot of events, online events happened. They came and they went. But the thing is, the, the see, it's not about. To, <laughs> Uh, I have to be very realistic and very honest. The, the format of this is, even though it's like a daily show, we have few people on the show. It's a very personal um, kind yeah. of uh, uh, involvement and discussion that we have with the investor base, be the investor base of the startup. And this mm -hmm. has gelled very well. Like I have, I already have a relationship with you. I've spoken yeah. to you before. <laughs> I've spoken to you, spoken to you for the second time. And I'm mm -hmm. sure I'm going to speak to you again. So yeah. this has obviously helped to build a trust. Mm -hmm. And it goes... It goes with other people I speak to as well. And mm -hmm. you're very rightly um, uh, pointed out, this is going to, the way we are doing business or we were doing mm -hmm. business before COVID-19 will definitely change because we are yeah. saving, we are saving uh, um, you know, the costs on uh, you know, hosting huge conferences that yeah. comes with a lot of cost, traveling, mm -hmm. accommodation, you know, you know how, how, what kind of expenses goes into it. But yeah. if you are able to, have build that trust over time if you're able to close deals on online yes. I mean, why would a uh, why would a company think of a mm. you know, mm. you know, bringing all these people together uh, into a physical event yes. big sized if they could just do this over over online was a trust yes. trust factor and blockchain technology rightly mm. uh, rightly said has mm. i think what I have seen is, is it's not a couple of months, but a couple of days from days to weeks, a lot mm. of crypto hedge fund hedge funds have just um, come up. The family offices, they've just contacted me. They want, they're looking for startup mm -hmm. in the space, in the space mm -hmm. of blockchain, in the space of crypto mm -hmm. to invest yeah. in. So this has shot up Bitcoin, you know, and the adoption. Mm -hmm the rate, the way, you know, blockchain as a technology was always there. It was a good boy. Like I would say the good child. <laughs> but it was a crypto it was not the nice child. <laughs> people were like, oh, it's, a, it's a, probably it's a scam. Crypto is a scam. But now yeah. you see people, now they understand what is cryptocurrency. This is, 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 is a legitimate currency, I mean, on the blockchain technology. So people are starting to educate themselves. People are starting to work on it. So it has built a trust over, over, the, over mm. the time and the technology obviously has helped a lot as well. So mm. from my perspective, good times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.
You know, I was going to say, actually, on your point about a pivot, I think that is the key word to survive and thrive during COVID-19. So to give an example, for me, actually, and also for our clients, it doesn't actually really matter whether you're a one-man show or you're a multi-million business. Everyone is going through change. And it's interesting how some companies are dealing with it. So you have situations where some people are either laid off or pushed off, you know, whatever ladder they were on. And then they have to reinvent themselves. You know, even organizations need to reinvent themselves. And as simple as so I uh, have a good friend who used to be a head chef of a certain uh, quite, you know, top restaurant. And now they have to all go do takeaway. You know, how do you do, how can you give that experience in a takeaway form? You know, it's like you still want to run and, you know, maybe the price point might need to differ. But it's interesting because you still want to keep your customers and give them the same experience, but in a different way. And so, you know, what's interesting is is seeing how receptive people are to that as well. So, of course, it's not the same. You go to a nice posh restaurant, you give plastic forks and spoons. It's not the same as the metal one, right? You would rather like go home and eat, right? But I think it's I think it's simple things like that, and in which this is a great testing ground to try it, right? Like you say, like TikTok is another one I do not understand. I downloaded it. I tried to understand it. I know it's a booming business. I know if I was an investor, I would invest. But my problem is I don't really get it and maybe it's it's telling my age but like the pure millennials who are having so much fun and I think it's actually not the fact that it's the form of um, video it's more that it's entertainment if you're stuck at home you have so many hours of gardening cooking reading you can do you want to do other things right and of course you can watch Netflix but then if you actually engage it's a bit of fun a bit of laughter a bit of easing the stress as it were then you've got a a business so to speak so ironically people who are actually looking at gaming looking at you know um you know entertainment would do very well I mean how many people have subscribed over Netflix I don't know everyone probably has except for me (laughs) you know so so I think it's it's quite interesting how you know I think it's a bit of a trial error like I I go back to the court system you know um initially when they you know lockdown thing the courts were not open and then I think they decided okay fine we're going to upload everything online and we'll have hearings on zoom say and then because all the lawyers went online at the same time. It crashed. And so then they had to get everyone to come back in one by one. Now, my point to tell you this story, why, why I'm saying it's fascinating is because it means that there is a demand for technology in a way that wasn't before. For future conferences, you can imagine now that they have to have the capability to run it not just for 30 people, 300, but 3,000, 30,000 people, right? So where in the past where organizers, conference organizers might say, well, it's a waste of money. Now it's like, okay, how do we invest this? You know, how do we invest our time and money? Because you can still charge for tickets. You can still charge for, you know, so to speak, an experience, depending on people, whether they want to fly or not. But these are really serious questions because, you know, for the whole year, I've noticed a lot of conferences being postponed or cancelled. So next year is going to be a very busy year. And so for them, whether they're going to survive or not, it's a question of whether they've got the know-how to pull it off yeah. because it also takes a lot of effort. I'm sure you know more than me on this. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, the thing is, it's a very good question and it's a very tricky one as well because we don't know the answer. So we mm-hmm. un- un- until we have a vaccination for getting rid of this uh, virus or just mm. at least under control, we don't know the future of events. We don't know the future yeah. of events. It's going to be that large scale, that mass scale with, with no, like so many people. You can't be having masked people moving around in conferences. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's very difficult to, you understand what I mean? It's not yeah, that yeah. you know, just sitting anywhere chatting and having a masked lot of people. I mean, it's, if you think logistics, uh, like getting everybody temperature scanned, <laughs> it's going to be a task in itself, right? <laughs> it's very yeah. difficult to think of that because I have attended our huge conferences and I can just visualize it's so difficult. So I don't mm-hmm. know the future hold, but we have to pivot. Like our startups, yeah. um, you know, people have to be ready for the for the for the worst. I mean, I think we already see uh-huh. the worst now, so we don't know the future. Mm-hmm. So I think we all have to be prepared for the worst. On that note, I would like to ask you a question about other markets. Like, you know, we touched up on Dubai, the startup hub in Dubai. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what about uh, Japan? So what's okay. the adoption? Uh, what's the what's the startup community like in Japan? Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Like so 
Yeah, so I think Japan is a very interesting market. So I've had the honor, as it were, to live in Japan for about six months, where I studied、um, the startup. Seen very intensely in different cities, actually. So Tokyo has their own environment.、Um, there's a place called Nihonbashi, which is a very thriving traditional. It's got the famous,、um, I think, traditional bridge. You will see that I think Japan, in in a nutshell, is a combination of contradiction, but in a good way. So it's got the best of tradition and it's got the best of technology.、Um, Like、uh, the UAE, it has a lot of conventions, you know, on AI in terms of expos and that.、Yeah. I think we're famous for the car shows,、um, you know, and all that.、Um, Kyoto for me is a very interesting place because it prides itself as being one of the oldest setup and businesses. So you can go there and you can find maybe a business that was running for thousands of years, let's say, and at the same time they're still selling kimonos. You know, it's the same name, same brand. So. For a young startup, let's say over a few years, going there, if one is able to succeed in making business with them, it is like, you know, it is like I don't know how to describe it. it, it it's like you know, going to the Queen of England and saying, "Hey, I want a slot somewhere in Buckingham Palace." Like you, it shows that you've got the clout to pull something off like that. And and Kyoto as a city is is amazing because it's a lively student environment. It's got the tradition, and so. You know, outside of Tokyo, it is the second biggest, I would say, tourist attraction for the samurai castles and all that. But for startups, I think it is a very intriguing place for me. So that's a place where I would say, for those businesses that have something unique, combining it with history, I would say it's a good place to go.、Uh, another place I would highly recommend is Fukuoka because of the geography. So.、Um, I talked about Tokyo last. I think that's the best way. So, if you look at the map of Japan, you have Tokyo, and then the very end, you've got a place called Hakata, Fukuoka, and that is for me the one of the ideal geographical locations in the Northeast Asian regions because it's two hours from Busan, I think a few hours from Hong Kong, three hours, and probably Singapore. But you will see in this realm, you you are two, well back then. I would say two hours flight. Now I'm not sure. Maybe I have to go by ship.、Um, But it's a very interesting mix because on the weekends you get people flying over back then, you know, from South Korea, from Hong Kong, you know, going there for shopping and all that. It's a very relaxed environment and it's famous for its ramen, you know, famous for the food and everything. So if you're a foodie, I would highly recommend.、Um, the governor there is、um, a young, you know, a very He's full of enthusiasm for startups. So I would say in terms of regulation, in terms of The desire to set up, aside from Tokyo, which is a lot of noise, it's a very busy environment. Hakata Fukuoka is where I would say is is a probably easier entry point if one were to enter the Japanese market. Now, a lot of people ask me the same questions like the UAE. So you have to speak Japanese, you have to do this and do that. I don't know. Having said that, I did study Japanese for four years. I do understand the Japanese culture probably more than you know the usual.、Um, But it doesn't, I think, necessarily impinge on doing business because what's interesting about Japan is I would say it's more modernized、um, than you can ever imagine. In fact, I sometimes feel Japan is more European than European,、uh, in the sense that you know, if we go back in history in the 18th century, you know, you had a period called the Meiji Restoration. I don't know if you, you were aware of that, but basically there was this desire to learn from the West. So that's what they did. You know, they went out to look at the legal systems, you know, the technology. So even back in the 18th, you know, we're talking about 18th, the 1860s, they really went out there, and I think. In an interesting way, it has set the path for Japan to be modern in a way that you know it's it's not comparable to say like Thailand or like other developing but also Asian countries, even Hong Kong. But at the same time, it's traditional because it somehow maintained it through its own culture, which is you know Shintoism and all that. So. If I were a startup and I'm interested in the Japanese market, I would say it's traditional first and foremost. So. It's not what you know; it's who you know. The same like the Middle East is very much business oriented, and you can't expect success over, overnight. In fact, some people are like, you know, it's so hard to deal with you know Japanese businesses. Well, I can say you know because I'm part of、um, an Asian organisation or legal group called Inter Pacific Bar Association, and I was also part of the British Japan Law Association and worked as a you know as a committee member. I can say that you know if the understanding is there and you know the Business mind is there. Whilst it will take time, business will happen. So you know, it, it's、um, 
it's different from say the European market. Like for example, in the UK, I can easily go and meet a client and get business tomorrow. But yeah. it's not the same. It's not the same. If you're talking about a trusted advisor, if you're talking about, you know, you want long-term success. So you really need to do the groundwork. Ironically, having been to Japan and then come to UAE, I think it's easier to do business in Japan. <laughs> Maybe it's all relative because I don't because I don't speak Arabic, but I think um, like all things, you gotta you gotta show commitment, you gotta show interest. So when I say commitment, so for the guys I've met previously who've been to UAE once, maybe they came back second time, and go okay, I lose patience, that's it, I'm going to America. That's not showing commitment. That's just showing all you're interested is getting the first round investment and leaving. So what they're interested in is. If you're going to set up a business or you're going to do business with us as a supplier or as a buyer, are you here for the long term? And so at every point, you're going to be tested. Now, interestingly, say in Japan, which I think is similar to Singapore, is you love going out, eating food, you know, going out and really showing commitment. Can we be friends as much as we are business partners? That is a big part of it. You can't just say, OK, I'm going to meet you for, uh, during business hours and then forget the evening because the evening is where business is done, you know, through the sake, through the drinking, through the izakaya, which is beautiful, right? It, it's, it's seeing a different side of the culture and experiencing, you know, experiencing to the fullest. Um, in the Middle East, obviously, because it's a Muslim country, we don't do drinking, as but obviously, you know, in terms of Western businesses, there are. But it's the same thing. If you get to the point where they invite you to, you know, their local restaurant or to the house, then you're doing very well, right? And I think these things, they don't teach you at business school. They don't teach you, you know, when you learn. It's more like you go out there into the real world and, you know, for the likes of you and me who are very sociable, it's very hard because how do you socialize online, right? It's not the same. So what you do, you, there's a lot of groups that are set up, like WhatsApp group, um, you know, like what you're doing, regular meetups. Um, it cannot replace, it absolutely cannot replace the face-to-face, -face, but this is where, you know, you've got to ask yourself, well, how am I keeping in touch with them? So what I do is sometimes I, I you know, since COVID-19, I've sent out, you know, um, emails to people or, you know, just checked up with them, say, hey, how are you doing? How's your family? And, and this does take time. It does take an effort, but it's also recognized. So when I, you know, I mentioned this last time as well, when I sign off and I say, I really look forward to seeing you next time, I really genuinely mean it. So then, you know, it's, it's all these little things that I think um, all count at the end of the day, because I think this idea of unseen is unheard or unheard is unseen. And I think the effort makes all the difference, the extra mile, I would say. So, yeah, so I, I actually love Japan. It's one of my favorite places. And Tokyo, I, oh my God, the food. <laughs> That's what I miss the most, being in the Middle East, Japanese food. Yeah, yeah I've been to Tokyo for, um, for the event, Tokyo Game Show, I think. Uh, yeah. The famous one. So, yeah, I love the food. I mean, obviously, Singapore, you can't. Yes, it's also very good. good. <laughs> yeah, best place to be uh, if you are a foodie. Yeah, it's to be in Singapore. And yes, the big conferences get, uh, you know, you have all the big conferences happening all around the year in Singapore. And this is the best kind of place I've seen so far because I, I used to travel South East Asia, Dubai, as you rightly said, Dubai, they don't drink after, you know, uh, the conferences uh, get over. But in Singapore, it's quite open, very, very open culture. And yeah. we, I mean, the real business gets uh, happened at the networking events that we have, yeah. that we used to have yeah. uh, last year. So, so what I've seen difference between um, what I've, what I've seen, I have, I have talked to uh, Japan just once for a conference uh, related to blockchain. Yes. Um, if you see countries like Dubai, uh, Singapore, Southeast Asia, or Korea, that South Korea as well. I mean, they're quite uh, pro when it comes to, when it came to the uh, having conferences, especially mm. the bigger ones in blockchain, you name it. They used to host uh, these bigger conferences, but Tokyo, Japan, not so much. Mm. So what, what do you think? Is it because they're culturally, um, a little um, slow. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you're the best person. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is the, what is the reason? Why would that be? Yeah, so there is a, there's a, this is a really cultural nuance. So let's say if I do a comparison with America, right? Um, it's like who speaks the loudest, who, you know, dominates the show, um, gets the more presence. Whilst well, in Japan, you could say it's a bit more subtle. In, in fact, the opposite is probably encouraged, right? So humility, you know, so when you have big conferences, even when they get top CEOs speaking, you will see how modest they are compared to the American counterparts. And this is just, I'm just saying it not to show like how arrogant Americans are, but it's just to see there's a quite a nuanced um, 
scenario where, for example, if let's say you have a panel, you have like an American speaker and you have Japanese speakers, the Japanese speakers, no matter the seniority, in fact, the more senior, the more quiet they are. That's just how it is, by the way, um, in the way the style they do business. So what's interesting is I've done business where, let's say you have a meeting, the most senior person in the in the room will not speak. It's the junior, the most junior person that speaks. The most senior person would either nod their head in agreement or probably give you a funny look, which probably means like, no, I don't agree. But the Japanese are very subtle in how they, when you talk about doing business, how they present themselves. So where you, particularly if it's foreigners flying into Japan, they will want to give them airtime out of respect and courtesy, which is interesting, isn't it? It's not the same way in America. It's like, okay, we've got 15 minutes. We're going to split it. Everyone has 10 minutes. What you're going to find is probably going to give the American guy or woman who flew all the way to come to Japan probably like a good 20 minutes whilst everyone has five minutes because it's out of courtesy they want to show respect and that is the same in terms of you know particularly if you're a foreigner so for me it's a it's an interesting experience for me because I blend in for a start but then the moment I open my mouth they see I'm a gaijin um you know an Australian accented or you know British accented lady um but there's a lot of there's a lot of respect in fact I didn't find um I mean, I'll give you a really good example. Yes, I was meeting one of potentially the biggest trading houses in Japan and they were so nice to me. They're like, Helen, you can come here and have coffee anytime. It took me a few meetings to realize business is not going to happen. And, and, it, and it's because purely they never said we're not going to be able to invest because we're too big. OK, that's a different scenario. It's not because they're too small. It's because they're too big. Right. Um, in whatever startups, you know, we were talking about. So rather than saying, you know, so so sorry, you know, the, the kind of business that you're doing is not what we're looking for. They didn't say that. They actually said the opposite, <laughs> which is we we'll welcome you to come whenever you wish. And you know, so it took me. So it, it's rather than them telling you we, we're not going to do business. It's you figuring it out on your own. But so then I was very polite about it. And I said, thank you very much for your time, because actually it is true. But I'm thanking them for their time. But at the same time, you see how they will never say no. So you've got to figure it out because all they're giving you is the politeness. See, yeah. so it's it's so that's why this is where it can also get tricky. So you get the so you get it's like opposite of two ends. You either get rejections all the time, which is what Americans revere. You only succeed if you get rejected, you know, a billion times. But in Japan, it's the opposite because you can't tell. So you've got to suss it out yourself. So what I would say is, if people are determined, be it the Middle East or Japanese market, they just need to stick at it. Really, but obviously, if the tech doesn't work, then they have to change, right? And there will be a way where, you know, you don't know whether you're offending people or you're appeasing people or whatnot until you've kind of slowly maneuvered. But what I think probably in both cultures they do appreciate is when you make an effort. So, for example, let's say you've got a really crappy product, but they can see you're making an effort, be it the presentation, be it you're providing information. At some point, they're going to listen and they go, wait a second, this person is trying. And I think, ironically, it's not famously, you know, you come in with an amazing product and you're going to sell right away. But rather, they say, wait a second, this person who's trying to do this is actually really making an effort. And I think we need to recognize that. And then that's where the door slowly happens. And I'll give you an interesting example. So a few years ago, I was in Japan and I was visiting two major cities, so Osaka and Tokyo. And when I was in Tokyo, I went to visit a number of clients and my schedule was in the following week, I'll be in Osaka, right? So I went to Osaka and long behold, I get a phone call from Tokyo saying, you know, we have a particular case for you. Can you come back to Tokyo? And I, because I already had a schedule, you see, so I had a schedule in Tokyo, I had a schedule and I already saw them in Tokyo, right? So to go back and, you know, cancel on my Osaka, you know, appointments is not so good. So I apologized. And then, you know, um, I said, I couldn't make it. Now, what happened was, they wanted to instruct me for this piece of work, right? Now, in the end, they had to, they found another lawyer to, to do the work. But I'll give you an example. Had I, I did think, had I cancelled my appointments in Osaka to just attend their meeting without knowing whether I'll get the meeting, it may increase my chances. You see the difference, right? Because it yeah. shows commitment. It shows commitment that for, for whatever reason, I'm prioritizing them. I'm canceling my appointments to come and meet them. So they would feel more obliged to give me that piece of work. So it's not, so it's an unspoken rule. It's, it's almost like you've got to almost like play your cards in a way so that, you know, they can see you're showing commitment um, or at least trying, you know, because if you go off the bat, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy, I'd rather go to the beach, then clearly you're not going to get that piece of work. So no, it's, it's, a, 
it's a very sort of subtle dance and even the way you reject people because it's not rejection but they will see it as rejection has to be very soft right so you know so so this is very similar actually the cultures are very similar the the saving face oh my gosh you will understand you're from singapore yeah. the saving face is absolutely particularly the more senior they are the more you have to read between the lines and give them all the benefit of the doubt you know when it comes to it that you know and, and that's something i've learned so much actually from my you know interaction in, in japan and i'm still learning here by the way i'm still, yeah. Yeah. I'm still learning the rules the unspoken rules here yeah Great. because of the lockdown probably you know we you are we are all, all in our own uh, the countries that uh, Uh, we are supposed to be maybe i yeah. don't know i mean <laughs> so yeah we just for you dubai is home now and you yeah so So one of the things, whether, you know, I, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I'll share it. I'm looking with the view of potential startups and investors is you always give the more senior people the benefit of the doubt. So let's say you're in a meeting, there are senior people. Let's say it was your idea. Okay. It was your idea. But they'll say, blah, blah, blah. And it's exactly what you just said. You give them the benefit of the doubt and say, it's a great idea. You don't put the other way, which is, hey, wait a second. I just said that a second ago. That will not go down very well. That will not go down well. In fact, you need to have the confidence in knowing they heard your idea. They then think it's their idea. And then you say, wonderful, what a wonderful idea. And then obviously you put the credit not to yourself, which is a very European, Western centric. And you say that was a team effort. Wonderful. And I, I tell you why I'm saying this, right? Because um, at least in my firm, more, majority of people are Arabic speakers. And so when we go in there for client meetings and deals, half the time it's in Arabic. So I don't know, honestly, what goes on. But I have faith in my colleagues. And when they close the deal, I'm like, wonderful, great, deal done, right? Like, well, that's all I need to know, right? So, so that's exactly it. I think um, it's having that level of trust. It's understanding that if the senior agrees or repeats what you say, that actually they're echoing what you've worked on, you know, be it an idea, a suggestion, a proposal, then it has to be a good thing, right? So rather than thinking, oh my God, Nick Picky, that was my idea, suggestion, you give them the credit and that will open doors for you in terms of your career. So it's a very different approach to say my experience in London or Australia or even America, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you give first and then you take second. I think that's probably a, a good way to look at it because you will find that in the UAE culture and particularly in Japanese culture, they're very generous with their time, you know, the whole gift giving culture, you know, so it's, it's interesting. And it's interesting, particularly how this will all be played out online, right? <laughs> particularly when you can't meet people, you know, face to face. <laughs> Absolutely. Good to know about the different perspectives and different countries, Dubai, UAE and Japan. Uh, but uh, Singapore, I think, uh, I think it's, it's quite uh, Western, I would say, uh, because okay. primarily because um, you know we have so many, so many people, so many nationalities from different countries living here: uh, U.S., Australia, Europeans. So it's quite uh, you know uh, the laws and regulations and the way we do business. Yeah, I think yeah, very, yeah. Well. I think one thing I should also mention is because you know because in the UAE the majority population is actually of Indian descent or Indians and Pakistanis, and I guess in Singapore there's also a you know a healthy sizable population that's also from India. And then we talk about technology, okay? Where of course India is like the country with you know the latest technologies. So I'm also very curious to see what you know new ideas will come out from India, you know new inventions and whatnot, because um, the investors here and also the startup. here i think you know or second third generation so they've been here for a long time yeah right. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well yes yes we have all uh race and nationalities i mean you can name name it i mean everybody prefer singapore in asia <laughs> <laughs> to be yeah. to the safety net that we have here yeah. smooth yeah. uh, policies and regulations that you, we mm -hmm. have here so yeah so okay let's move from Uh, this aspect to uh, you just touched up on STO uh, while we just started the call. Mm -hmm. You said that you just closed a uh, uh, offering, the like STO offering yeah. or something uh, recently, and it's very new um, when it comes to uh, you know STOs and everything else. Mm -hmm. What about uh, what about um, you know you know you ICOs or IOs? Mm -hmm. uh, 
how how much how much are you involved in that space in terms of yeah 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 so i think um so for example at our firm at hamdan al shamsi we do advise on startups and i've got some colleagues who are in the corporate team who deal more regularly with them so for me it's more an advisory on the business side and at the idea side in difc so what i would say is for example um specifically say difc in relation to dubai and adgm which is in abu dhabi is that you have the regulators and the regulators are the ones that would approve let's say if you were a startup and you wanted um to set up an office let's say in DIFC or ADGM and you have this financial product which they obviously are regulating you know and because as i mentioned before only about 2 weeks ago the DIFC actually approved um one of the you know first and largest securities token is actually a japanese headquartered uh, company in relation to properties wow. so it's all very new so i wouldn't say yes or no definitively from the outset what i would say is if you're a startup you're a business and you're interested in say entering the middle eastern market you can come to a law firm or you know a business advisory service you know just to see okay well what do we need to do to get a sort of approval or or get a foot in the door to actually talk to the authorities and say will it be something of interest to them so rather than assuming oh like you know i can do this in america or singapore or hong kong in the same way it's actually i would say on a case by case basis particularly if you have something innovative something different um as i said before a lot of the asset management investment houses in um dfc they're traditional they're not actually i mean you know i can count my fingers one or two that are actually looking into blockchain so that's why i would say that because it's so new you want to get the regulators on your side sooner than later so i'll give you an example there is one business that had contacted us because they need to fill the questionnaire but they don't know um how to answer it now on the one hand you could say yeah you could do it yourself but the chances of being rejected or being further questioned is quite worrying because you're like look i just want to do my thing i don't really need all this bureaucracy what's for us we speak english and arabic which will make your life a lot easier like, i don't speak arabic but my colleagues do right so for them to be able to speak their language to explain things you know to sort of get the ball rolling um particularly if you're not int- uh, not um you don't know the jurisdiction very well it helps a lot i'll give you an example there is a firm from a portuguese company and they have been looking at the middle eastern market for a number of years let's say 3 to 4 years they still haven't set up so i said look you guys need to just set something up if you need help we're here to help because you need to test the market here in person you can't just you can i mean if your business model is you just want to fly in and fly out like the way you talk about conferences that's fine but if you really want to deep dig deep into the market if you really want to talk to investors who are interested in potentially investing in you long term you want a presence here in the middle east you know what i mean it's like you want to do business in singapore there's only so much flying in and flying out particularly with covid-19 right so you need to set up properly in singapore to then be able to say look what can i do to set up in the kind of business that i want and particularly when it's new um when you know about securities token how can i talk to invest uh, uh, regulators and it is very very common even for us for us to go and visit the regulator so in a sense that if you're going to fly in and fly out it's not convenient so why not set up here plan it so that be it you recruit locally or overseas to have someone on the ground you know to talk to people on the ground so then you can grow roots you can then develop the business and so therefore actually to be honest it's no different like any traditional business i think the difference is the strategy might be slightly different in terms of how you start out because right now we can't go anywhere <laughs> so then you might say okay let me correspond but at, at some point you know like i say people are going to say well i want to see you i want to see whether you're real so i want to see the 3d of you as a ceo cfo whatever um and then go from there so i think from the standpoint of doing business it's no different like any jurisdictions so you could be africa right like any jurisdiction in ghana in you know zimbabwe wherever even in india right you want to come to kerala you want to go to new delhi it's no different but i think in terms of how you want to have buy in i would say in the past in the uae where there was it was only limited to you know 50 50 local ownership now you can be a foreign owned company in your own right 100% so that is a big incentive to say hey okay hey guys you know if we're interested in the middle east we don't need to you know worry about that that side of it but what we do need is good advice and so once you get the good advice you got people advising so so one way we've been helping clients to give an example is to get them to sign what we call power of attorney so in other words you can give me you're in singapore you give me a power of attorney i can act on your behalf as if you were here like that was a 
document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any official documentation set up, you know, we team up with another organization to do this. So you could be, you know, we can be, I can be helping you, you're based in Singapore, I'm here right now. You tell me exactly what you need, I can help you do it. So, so we are cutting down borders, as it were, but having someone on the ground makes a world of a difference, right? And so I'm trying to help the, these guys who have been flying back and forth for the last three, five years, not getting anywhere to say, look, guys, you want some proper help? We can give you some proper help. You can give us a POA. You can still do your business. If you want to set up meetings, we set up together. We'll attend the meetings with you, knowing that we're on the ground. And I think it gives not just you the comfort, it gives the client the comfort that there's someone they can just knock on the door and say, hey, can we meet for lunch or coffee and just talk? Yeah. I mean, it's simple, right? I mean, I'm saying it like it's so simple. Back Pre-COVID-19, this is a piece of cake. Post-COVID-19, it's a huge logistic <laughs> endeavor, right? But, but I'm just giving you an example. And slowly, slowly, like, I'm also trying to organize meetings with people and all that. And, you know, it's happening. But I think we'll need to give it another good six months to see how things will pan out, you know. But that's, that's my thoughts. Anyway, I'd love to hear. How, how do you think business will be different in, in Singapore? You know, is it still face-to-face -face or online? Yeah. No, it's not only about Singapore, I would say. Yeah. I think in every country, it's the same yeah, yeah. Uh, situation. Like, we all are facing the same situation because of yeah, social yeah, distancing yeah. and, you know, physical distancing. So I think digital um, appetite has picked mm. up everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of uh, digital payments um, yeah, yeah. You know, everywhere. Yes. Like Singapore, South Asia, or India, talk about any uh, country. I mean, the digital appetite has gone up because we are yeah. forced to now, because we are yeah. sitting at home, you know, e-commerce online has picked up Amazon, like reported that yeah. their uh, profits, like they've just humongously gone up because everybody's yeah. shopping online. Yeah. So it applies yeah. to everywhere, every country um, that we live in. Um, how this is going to change in the next six months? I don't think anything mm -hmm. is going to change in the next six months. That's what I predict. I'm yes. happy to be wrong. <laughs> I'm yeah. happy to be wrong, but I predict it's going to be this year, 2020. We just have to have a reset. Mm -hmm. Like we just have to reset ourselves, as you rightly said. Think through, think to start planting the seeds mm -hmm. right now. Yes. Restructure yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the time to just, uh, you know, as you rightly said, take a step back and re-strategize uh, your business strategies uh, mm -hmm. for next year. Who yeah. knows with the vaccination, you know, and things yeah. most back to the old normal the normal that yeah. we had to live in yeah. so yeah this is a this is a time we should just take our break not break in some sense like literally going on vacation <laughs> we can't yeah. anyway but yeah rethink yeah. re yeah. yourself yeah. On, the, on the closing notes because we just have three yeah. moments to uh, yeah. go uh, so I, I mean Helen it's very nice to have the relationship with you and yeah. uh, talking to you again opening up uh, the cultural nuances of every country is, is a very good thing to know. I, I think we can bridge that gap between UAE and South East Asia mm -hmm. or Singapore, mm -hmm. by, because of this, the region we're talking about. Um, yeah. So you are there to help the startups from this side of the world. Oh, sure, uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Bridge that gap between the two um, yeah. countries. You know? Yeah. So that's and yeah, and just on that point, I want to share with you. So next Wednesday and Thursday, um, we are actually um, getting a group of investments who I told you were the first um, security tokens um, doing a webinar with us. And then on the Thursday, actually FinTech Hive. So I'd love to invite you and your members um, to join us. I need to double check whether it's going to be live live or whether we're going to send the video out. But I'll definitely share the link with you because that's definitely up your street. It's all about FinTech. So then you will get hear it from the horse's mouth about FinTech in the UAE. Okay, great. Thank you, Helen. I mean, thanks for your time today. We just had, we spoken a lot and we become like more and more close, like that we opened up uh, into a lot, a lot of things, right? <laughs> uh, so thanks to have you uh, again. And I think uh, thanks for your time today. Thanks for your patience, giving us one hour airtime. <laughs> um, so, so it comes, so, so we are uh, now at the end of the session. I would like to say people, thanks for watching us. Even though it was like, a, a, you know, one just one speaker today unfortunately other speakers couldn't um attend because of the timing constraints and other commitments they had um you can watch our shows monday to friday uh, at uh, www.latokin.com slash events it's all there on our website so pick up a subject of your interest like today's topic was fintech and blockchain in asia uh, so pick up a topic of interest and let me know or let my team know what is of interest to you and we can 
always invite you to speak at our um, at our VCTV. So it's a good way to stay connected, stay engaged, and I love talking to people and sharing knowledge with everyone. Thank you, Helen, again, thank and you. hopefully talk to you soon. Yes, same here, same here. You take care.